I, I suggest we start. Yes, let's go. So, should we start with fun stuff like logistics? Oh, I guess just a few things. There's not that much updating, right? Yeah. So, I guess Sunday, the next Sunday is around the corner. Yeah. There will be another set of lectures, another problem set, another due date, right. soft one, and yeah. a hard one. Yeah. And then we have, uh, just to remind people, the, the due date is always a Pacific time. So to adjust to whatever it is, because the computer will close you out after yeah. after midnight uh, California time. So there's some discussion on the forums about this. And a couple of you have been frustrated. And I, I apologize that um, both technical and uh, fairness reasons, so we, we stuck with these hard deadlines. Uh, technical, because the system actually locks it down at that point. And uh, it doesn't have to be this way, but uh, it is. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, if, if we have 50 people in class, we, we uh, can kind of make individual kind of uh, considerations. But when there's tens of thousands of you, uh, it's just uh, not just not tenable, also unfair. So we just ask, it's, it's, it's all written down, but I understand that some people don't always read everything that carefully. But just uh, in this case, we do ask you to read uh, the instructions carefully. And if, if in doubt, uh, just do it early. Okay. Otherwise, um, uh, uh, content-wise? Yeah, things, things seem to be moving along pretty smoothly. The forums are pretty active. Uh, getting some interesting questions uh, popping up. So we can either start with those or start with some other uh, yeah, well, we picked a couple of things that came up. Came up. As usual, uh, you're doing a very good job of answering as well as posing the questions and uh, often giving answers that are better than the answers uh, we gave or maybe even capable of giving. But what are some things we might chime in on? Yeah, so uh, there's been one question, that it's some version of it that keeps popping up, which is a question of rationality and, and whether people are self-interested and why people are doing often ending up with payoffs that are lower than, than the social good, and whether game theory is studying sort of excessively greedy people. Uh, th that seems to be a, a recurring theme, and I guess uh, you know there, there's a lot to say about that. I don't know if we want to. Uh, I think you know one thing that we emphasized early in the course is that if you think in, in situations where people might be altruistic or care about general good, then that's something that game theory can write into their objectives and their payoffs. Uh, but also that, that things like prisoner's dilemmas and tragedy of the commons, um, they're quite unfortunate realities. So you know, we, we look at depopulation of species, or you look at uh, deforestation of Europe and the industrial age or you know these things people you know the these models actually predict what happens and and, and understanding that is important to improving our world in some ways but in, so I, I suspect this is an issue that will come back probably every week and um, in fairness um, th there is an issue here isn't there that um, Occasionally, we do have a divergence between the predictions of equilibrium sure, and what we see in life. In fact, we'll see momentarily uh, yeah. an example in the, uh, in the lab. So sometimes, uh, now you could argue that's simply a failure of modeling, that we didn't model the payoffs right. Um, I think also there's a, one thing we tend to underestimate is the heterogeneity of the human population. And if you look out there, there's people who are very altruistic and social-minded. There are people who aren't. There are people who are somewhere in between. There are people who can be prodded to under social circumstances. And, and you know, we, the, the the diversity of behavior we'll see in the lab, I, I think, is re quite reflective of, of what diversity there is in the world. So uh, I, I think that that's, uh, you know, something that we don't always take into account properly. 
Um, but still, and again, I think part of the value of having both of us here is having some creative tension here, is the area of that game theory is called bounded rationality does point to a an issue that is not uh, perhaps as well handled in game theory as as is, as ought to be. Where when you set up the game in a way that's reasonably faithful to the situation, the uh, agents are not necessarily um, <coughs> uh, fully capable of modeling each other with the infinite regress right. that is implicit in the Nash equilibrium, or making uh, infinitely complex uh, inferences. And so uh, there is there's, uh, really, in fairness, an issue there. Sure. I'm going to let you handle uh, some other issue while I invite some more people here. OK. And, uh, so okay. go ahead. Um, so so I, one other question that people have raised uh, just through the forums and so forth is, when we're looking at, at the difference between backward induction and, and Nash equilibrium, uh, why is there a difference in, and how do we understand some of these things? And um, I, I think one thing that's really important to, to keep in mind is that when we're looking at things like uh, backward induction, what's happening is, is we're looking at the solution of a game understanding that people can look forward and predict what's going to happen in certain parts and then go backwards and, and uh, then react to that. And Nash equilibrium just requires that given your beliefs about other people, you choose the best action, which doesn't necessarily um, have to impose a credibility because people might never be called on to, to actually do something. So. Uh, that, that that can allow for differences in behaviors, um, and and there's actually a, a, a good bit of a, a question of what what do we actually do when when we end up in a part of the game that we never expected we should have ended up in? Right? So how do we suppose I'm playing Yoav in a game and I think he's perfectly rational and then he makes an irrational move from my perspective? <laughs> what, what, what do I think at that point? How do I react? Uh, what what actually happens? So. So these, these questions are deep ones, and, and I think part of the reason that we're seeing differences here is that there's no single way to predict what, how people are going to behave, and, and there's different, you know, rationality is a vague term uh, in some ways. There's different, not vague, but can be made precise in different ways, and, uh, and that leads to different predictions. Now, this is a very important moment in the uh, history of the course. In fact, I would say even history of game theory, uh, coffee has arrived. <laughs> there you go. Hey, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, good morning, uh, good morning, everybody. <laughs> so, um, I've, uh, we've just in invited some more people. Again, for people who have just joined now, we, uh, we um, accidentally under-invited uh, in advance. So, we're trying to invite people now in real time. and. Uh, uh, four more of you have uh, sent requests, and I'm going to send some more invitations, and uh, then uh, we'll um, uh, we'll start maybe having a discussion with you all. And uh, what I do ask is everybody who's joining, please uh, make sure your mics are muted, um, and uh, we'll unmute them when it's your time to uh, to speak. Uh, and obviously, if you have a, a, a webcam, I'll turn it on. Uh, so, Vander and Ishan. And Nipun. And uh, maybe uh, and, and and two more. Ashukas is 
probably not your either your first or last name. And one more, and then we'll call it a day as far as invitation goes. some questions then from the floor. Yes. Okay, so uh, we, uh, for some reason, these new invitations haven't joined yet, but we do have um, uh, Alex Fernandez, who's, we saw you for a moment there, your picture, but we don't see you anymore. And there you are. Hi there. And Rob and Shruti. Let's start with Shruti. And maybe, uh, seriously, we can't see you, but we can hear you if you unmute. So do you uh, have a question? Uh, not particularly. Okay. I'm sorry? Was it? No. Well, the answer not, was not no. Okay. I mean, uh, one of the things that I was talking about is, like, what would be the best strategy to use? And But you covered the rationality thing earlier when you guys were talking, so I think I'm okay with that. Awesome. Where, where, where are you from, Sruthi? Um, I'm in Chicago. Okay, I've heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank Just you. Just a few hours ahead of you, but yeah. thank you. Thank you. Please, please now mute your uh, mic again. Um, uh, uh, let's just go in order of people who joined. Uh, Rob, do you have a question? If you do, please unmute. Oh, Rob, that's good. Oh, you're typing. It means you, you oh, well, we okay. answered it already. Answered it. Boy, okay. we're very... Patient. <laughs> uh, I think the next one probably yeah. was uh, Alex. Alex Fernandez. Do you have a question, Alex? Yes, hello. Uh, my, I had two questions. One is for the min max and the man make, max min, because uh, I remember when it was uh, in a previous lecture related to the goalie and the goalkeeper. And uh, now when it's come back, I thought that I had understood it. I do not really know if I have fully understood it. So if you could go through it uh, at least quickly, that would be great. And I have a second question, if, if I may. It's, uh, this, this is fairly, fairly short, should be uh, when you're talking about the, the discount factors uh, from the lecture, uh, I think I got confused because uh, when you got beta or P uh, going towards one, that should be considered a high discount factor. And right. uh, otherwise, if it's close to zero, right? Right. Yes. That's correct. Okay. Because uh, then I probably misunderstood it in the lecture because I thought it was the other way around, but it, it didn't make sense. So I'll review it anyway. I take a stab at this. Yeah. Let me. I can. Let me, I can take. I can take the second one really quickly. Sure. So sometimes one will say, high. I mean, discount factor being high means close to one, but sometimes, you know, you're you're talking about how much. Uh, away from one where we are. So sometimes we might, I might slip, for instance, in saying low discount, meaning that you're almost uh, to one. Uh, that there's not much of a, a difference between the two. Yeah, it's I, I, you're exactly right. It's a confusing use of, of language. Uh, so when we usually, when we say high discount, it means we're not discounting by much. Yeah. Very confusing. On min, max, and max min, this also is something that's uh, easy to stumble on. And I'm not sure if what I'll say now will be hugely illuminating, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, so you can ask uh, from one player's point of view, you can ask, uh, you know, what's the best they can ensure to themselves, assuming, let's, let's restrict it to two players just for now, assuming the other player uh, is doing their best to harm them no matter what the payoff to that other player is. And uh, your uh, max min value is uh, the uh, highest you can ensure to yourself under this very paranoid assumption. The min max asks, uh, from the other player's point of view, um, what is the lowest they can hold you to uh, from their point of view? And in, in principle, you could think these would be different quantities. In a zero-sum game, they're the same quantity. In general, 
um, uh, they're not. Uh, when you have multiple players, you need to be subtle about what does it mean. Uh, implicitly, you're assuming that the other players are colluding and coordinating. So somehow, by magic, they um, found a way to collude and harm you maximally. And that's what we have in mind when we speak about the minimum. Anything you wanted to add to this? That yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, just in terms of the intuition, I think a little bit, and, you know, why are zero-sum games, why do we get this magical theorem that they coincide, and then we get the, that coincides with a Nash equilibrium? It's, it's really that nature of, of complete opposition that's, that's present in something like soccer. Uh, you know, one person's gain is the other person's loss, and, and those kinds of games have this situation where, you know, the other person really does want to do the worst possible to you in, in terms of their, they want to, you know, if the other team wants to score, which is the worst possible thing for you, um, then you get these two things to coincide. And, and uh, uh, you know, then it's a powerful, it's a powerful tool most generally, but uh, I think that gives you an intuition for it. Okay, Alex, thank you. Did, did that at least not uh, <laughs> confuse you? you Yes, uh, actually, to to be frank, uh, it 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 makes uh, it makes more sense. Uh, nevertheless, I would like to li then listen to the lecture again to because I was taking some notes, and uh, as you probably know, when you take notes and you're listening at the same time, you may miss some points. But in 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 general, it makes it makes more. I mean, the pressure of the exams and the activities, it really helps. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Asim. Uh, are you there with us? Do you want to chime in? Sure, yeah. Hi. Uh, Good morning, or afternoon, or... Clarify a little bit uh, how the game becomes like a perfect, uh, sub-game perfect equilibrium. The uh, regime of going back and listening again is, is a good good thing to do. But, um, but it has to do with... Uh, um, credible threats and imagining what would happen had you gone to a certain place. So, uh, uh, you know, um, just think about the centipede uh, game, uh, right? You, um, and um, you have to say, you know, um, you have to imagine what will happen if I indeed get to a certain point in the game down the road. In that case, you say, well, surely in that case, this would happen. And then you have to say, okay, now when I look at places farther up the tree, I need to remember uh, that. Uh, and uh, the, so that's a very natural notion, uh, and that's the strong notion of subgame perfection. Uh, the simple Nash equilibrium allows you to assume strange things that might happen if you reach certain um, places and make uh, your decision based on those unreasonable assumptions. I don't know if this was helpful. Um, yes, very helpful? Much. yes, very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, before we, uh, uh, Ishan, we saw you for a moment. Now we don't see you, but we see a black screen. You're there. You want to show yourself? You want to speak? If you want to speak, you need to unmute your mic. Um, but we can cover a little bit of the, the okay. other slides. From yeah. Some of so uh, I think maybe we'll close this period of uh, discussion. So thank you all for coming in. And the last thing we'll do is we'll give you some uh, additional taste for what happened in the lab. And which one do you want to speak about? Do you want to do uh, centipede or the dollar? How about the dollar? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. That's the centipede. Yeah. Oh, we can do sorry. That All right. We get so we'll do both. Two for the price yeah. of one. Okay. Okay. So people always ask what happened in the games that were played, and uh, you played a centipede game earlier. And so this slide actually has some of the results um, from the centipede game. Oh, actually, uh, no, 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 no. So now you're they, they, they're, no, they're, this is what they're seeing. Actually. Oh, this is what you're seeing. Okay. Yes. So you want to go back to this slide then? I want to. I don't know how to. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, let me uh, 
Bear with us. We're uh, you, there, you, had, you opened it in two different screens. No, no, so this here is you go. Go. There you go. Okay. I think this is it. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one I want to see. Let's yeah. see if that's what we're seeing actually. There we yeah. Go. Okay. Great. So, so this is uh, the game where people were given uh, ten units, and then the one person could offer to a second player uh, uh, some amount of that, and then the second person had to indicate how much they'd be willing to accept. And the two charts there on the screen are this uh, first one is what the actual offers in the class were. And then the second chart gives what the acceptances were. So the first one lists, you can see there that uh, the most frequent offer was five, so a very fair split. And it's, it's a very focal thing, and this is not unique at all to the class. It's, uh, it seems to be borne out uh, by pretty much uh, whatever experiments people have run. It's a very frequent offer. And then the next most frequent one is one, where somebody tries to keep essentially almost everything that they can for themselves and give just enough to make sure the other person says yes. Uh, and indeed that coincides a little bit with what the acceptances were, that some people hold out for a half and then other people will be willing to take one and then there's some, a little bit in between there. Uh, and also this guy. Yeah, and then there's some people that want six. <laughs> which, uh, and that's actually, you know, it's a small blip, but it's actually a, a large number of people when you add, <laughs> add up the number of people in this class. Um, but so that gives you some idea that the backward induction solution doesn't necessarily make the right prediction. Um, and so what is that going back to the question about uh, the modeling implicit in, in the game theoretic analysis and, uh, and, and human behavior? Uh, should we take this as indication that perhaps Equilibrium analysis is not the end-all and be-all, or what's your position? Uh, Actually, you know, th this is very interesting. So uh, this has been a, something, this, this particular game has caused a lot of uh, discussion in, in game theory, and, and people wonder, look, maybe we, we're not understanding how to model people and so forth. One set of experiments that was done was a set of experiments where instead of just doing this with a dollar, people started doing it with a day's wages, then a week's wages, then a month's wages. And indeed, when you increase the amount of money at stake, the acceptances move down, so much closer to one in terms of you know, the percentage. They're willing to take a smaller percentage. Uh, and the offers uh, also, uh, pe people are offered less. Yeah. But, you know, it's, so, so yeah. it, it depends exactly on how much context you put in. If you put in real bargaining parties and so forth, then... Uh, you know, it's it, it's a better predictor of what happens, and when we're sort of casual about it, then it's a less best predictor, I guess. Uh, so you know, there's the uh, I think we mentioned in the past session. There's a famous uh, quote due to Canaro that game theory is a, uh, a, a great model of how game theorists behave. <laughs> yes. uh, but there's a measure of truth to that. Uh, the uh, Higher the stakes, the more the gain there is to hire to advise, and yeah. in this or that situation. Do you want to say something about the uh, the kind of the payoff here? Right, right. So that curve actually that you see now on your screen uh, um, gives you what your expected payoff would be for different offers. So, for instance, if you made an offer of five, it was almost surely accepted, and you got pretty close to five. If you made an offer of uh, two it was rejected quite frequently. And so even though you would get the eight left over, you got it so infrequently that it, it didn't pay off as well as offering five. So, so indeed, you know, offering five was the best thing to do against the population of what people were willing to accept. Um, so it, is, it turned out to be sort of a Nash or a best response to offer five, which is what most people uh, did. Awesome. All right, well, I think maybe this is a good point to, uh, to stop for this week. Um, Remember again, we have uh, Sunday uh, midnight Pacific time is when uh, you know the shoe drops, you turn into a pumpkin, whatever the right <laughs> metaphor is. Uh, but uh, please again, um, uh, err on the side of being early rather than late. Um, we um, we'll stick to this time, namely eight o'clock Pacific on Thursdays for our screenshot chats. 
keep uh, keep up the discussion in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the forums. And before we go, Alex, I see that you want to say something. Yes, thank you. I, I guess that Matt thought I was waving. <laughs> Not yet. I was just reading the chat. I, there's a question by Rob, but I, that I also shared. It's the if there. Are, how about the offers of nine? Can oh, we right, right. think of a rational answer for that, or is that part of the rationality you were mentioning in the beginning? Yeah, offers of nine are just. Uh, it could be you know of heterogeneity, very generous people, or or misunderstandings would, uh, of the game. Or uh, are you? Um, I, would you be inclined to offer nine, Alex? Personally speaking, or frank, frankly speaking, I would not. I, okay, I think because if yes, I want to play the game with you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> but with real money, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I think that in my first attempt, uh, I was giving, uh, expecting uh, five and giving five, but once I went through a lecture, of, of course, I was offering one. <laughs> I think that's uh, what the, most of the people did, but I was uh, surprised, as Rob was mentioning, about the, that offer of nine. Yeah. Good for the good for the crisis time that we're going at least in Europe through, but uh, <laughs> it's, right. it's also it's also good. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, Alex Mute and Suthi. Um, I see you have another question. Let's do the take it and then finish. Please go ahead. Okay, so uh, when I was actually oh. playing the game in the a lab, I found that um, the more often I offered four, that was accepted more than me offering anything less. So it just felt like for seeing the, you know, medium thing that someone would expect, like offering five would be the most basic thing anyone can do. But, you know, being altruistic and everything, but four seemed to be a better one, which is why I was kind of surprised that everyone offered five. Right, right. I just want your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the charts that we just presented were not from the interactive one that you've been playing just in the last couple of days, but actually from the earlier one where you were doing it in the abstract and you had to guess how people were going to react. And indeed, when you're doing it in an interactive way, then part of the reason that people can then hold out is if you realize that you can push people in a certain direction and that they're going to react, uh, you know, we end up with being pushed towards a Nash equilibrium not necessarily a uh, backward inductive solution. And, okay, and, yeah. You know, the, it, 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 whether it goes to four or five or exactly how it ends up, it depends a little bit on the population and how, you know, you're trying to do the best you can against the population that's out there and, and how that works out depends on uh, how people are acting. Of course, so uh, technically speaking, the person that makes the first move has the upper hand no matter what. Unless, of course, like someone said, you're off at nine, but... Right, right. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, the... Uh, wh who has the advantage, and uh, depending on the order of move, is a subtle thing, and we uh, we don't actually explicitly have it in our class, I don't think, but uh, we may have an opportunity to speak a little bit about... about uh, yeah, that would be a good topic for next time. Yeah, right. Yeah. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Or evening. Thank you.